Now we're going to read from two of the Gospels tonight because we're looking at the last two expressions. We'll uh, read them just now. And then after we've done that, I, I'll read a little harmony of the Gospels to you. You don't need to read that along with me. But we will read first of all in John 19. And then we'll read in Luke chapter 23. So John 19. And we'll read from verse 28 again, which is uh, where we were last night. And it says, after this, and Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now we'll read also in Luke chapter 23. And we're just going to read at this stage the one verse, verse 46, Luke 23 and 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now these are the two expressions we're going to look at tonight. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And maybe just to help a little bit with the sense, I have here in front of me a harmony of the Gospels. If you haven't yet got one, I, I really do recommend it to you. It's very helpful for just seeing the slight differences between them. And I'm just going to do read from the beginning of the hours of darkness to the end of the crucifixion. And you'll see where these two statements just fit in. Uh, and hopefully you'll just get a little bit of a better flow than just reading the two uh, verses that we read. So you don't need to turn to this. I'll just read it to you. And this is what we read. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. <clears throat> and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. That is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elijah. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. And when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things which were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God, certainly this was a righteous man. Now, that maybe just isn't 100%. Um, there's just a couple of little bits where you have to make a decision as exactly how it fits. But I do think it is fair to say that the bit where we've read these two together, it'd be just almost precisely how it sits. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit, and having said thus, he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now that was just combining the record of Luke and of John, and maybe just gave the sense of it. In fact, I think when you read the four Gospels, you may well come to the conclusion that this first cry we're going to look at, it is finished. While it is only John who tells us exactly what the cry is, 
I personally believe it is the only one of the seven sayings that is referred to by all four Gospels. I think you'll find Matthew, Mark, and Luke all refer to the Lord Jesus crying with a loud voice. And I would judge by looking at the Gospels collectively together, this is indeed what that cry was. It is finished. It's quite a number of years ago now as a younger man, just uh, the other night, Jack forwarded me a picture and there on the uh, front row of a conference in uh, Forgewood in Motherwell was my grandfather. And uh, that was the first time I ever sat at a bedside when somebody passed away was I had the responsibility, my parents were away in Australia and New Zealand at the time, and I sat at my grandfather's bedside as he passed away. He spoke to me almost to the very end. He was reasonably coherent, but his voice got weaker and weaker, and eventually I had to lean over him, and I had to literally hold my ear almost against his lips, just to hear the last faint words that he spoke before he went home to be with the Lord Jesus. And since then, sadly, we have sat at the bedside of both of our parents in the same circumstances. And in every case, there has been the evident weakness and the evident slowly slipping away of life and the quietening of the voice until it's merely a whisper, until it becomes virtually inaudible. Now, nothing like that happened here. What is most astounding here is this one who had said most carefully and accurately, no man taketh my life from me. I lay it down of myself. And if I lay it down, I will take it up again. And this is precisely what he did. We have mentioned in past nights, there were moments in his life, even the village where he was brought up, they would, sought, or would have sought to have taken his life. Even before that, the wicked one would have sought to have got him to act foolishly and potentially lose his life. Later on, they would seek to stone him. They were always too early. His time had not yet come. We mentioned that after these events we've read, they will come along to break his legs. The purpose of that is to cause ultimate suffocation and to bring the proceedings to an end and to take the life of the victim. Well, if on the previous occasions they'd been too early, now they're too late. No man taketh my life from me. And I believe that is seen in that this is not the timid last words of somebody whispering finish as his life ebbs away, referring perhaps to that life. This is the triumphant cry of someone who is totally aware of everything that's taken place and of what he has just accomplished. And in the light of that, he cries in triumph. He commits his spirit to God. He purposefully lays his own head, not in a slump, but in a purposeful movement. He lowers his head and bows it onto his shoulder. And his spirit goes to God. And he gives up the ghost. No man taketh my life from me. The word that he shouts, at least the form in which we have it, the loud voice, and the word really is a word tetelestai. Now it's become very famous. It was a famous word in its day anyway. Now that, of course, is the word in the Greek language, the Lord Jesus. It wouldn't have cried in Greek, he would have probably have cried in Aramaic. And uh, the scholars suggest that in Aramaic there would have been a single word as well. And when it's translated into our language, it becomes three words it is finished. In some ways, it might better have been just if it was one word. Many years ago, uh, I remember Mr. E.W. Rogers saying of the shortest verse of the Bible, instead of two words, he wishes they translated it into three and that it would have said, Jesus shed 
tears rather than just Jesus wept. And sometimes I do feel with this saying, it might have been uh, better just translated finished because it certainly was in the Holy Spirit's language, the language of Greek here that's used in scripture, one great word. It is the, and if you were to look up, you might see a different word. You might see the word teleo. And what you would discover that tetelestai is in fact the perfect tense of that verb. A perfect tense means that this is a past action that has a present effect. It means that something has been accomplished and always will be. You know, if you went through that window you can see behind me and across the lounge and through the next window, you would see the little square of grass that's in our front garden. Now, it's not very big. It's about maybe 12 foot square, so there's not very much of it. And that's the only bit of grass now in the house that we've moved to. And uh, every few weeks, uh, I try to go out and cut that grass. And I have to confess, it's not something I'm very keen on. It's not, my, it's not so much the cutting, it's the strimming around the edges that I'm particularly uh, unhappy with and don't like to do. Because if that silly little thing gets uh, snapped and you've got to try and get another bit out and I just can't be bothered with all of that. But when it's finished, you know, I come in with a real sense of satisfaction. I look out to see if I've managed to get a little stripe on it. And I'll come in and I'll say, well, that's it. It's finished. It's done. But unfortunately, it's not done and always will be. Because if I went there even just now, you would see that unfortunately it's at the stage that it needs done again. Now, that's because all I would be doing is something presently. And now I can say it's past. I cut it. But unfortunately, I'm going to have to keep repeating that again and again. The perfect tense is something that has been accomplished and always will be. Ida Sankey, Sankey, the song composer, said of this word, Tetelestai, it is the greatest word from the greatest man on the greatest day that the world has ever known. Spurgeon said this, in it is an ocean of meaning in a drop of language. An ocean of meaning in a drop of language. Warren Weasby, I think, says something very beautiful. He says, he didn't just make a down payment and expect me to keep up the installments. This is finished. It is finished, it stands finished, and it always will be finished. And I want us to see tonight precisely what the Lord Jesus is speaking about. I will suggest in the course of this address that there are a number of things that were finished and dealt with once and for all at this event. But I do think there is one particular thing that the Lord Jesus has in view. You would discover, if you look back in your um, Gospel of John, that the Lord Jesus was very aware of what lay before him. In John chapter 1, uh, you'll discover that John the Baptist made a great statement. He says, Behold the Lamb of God that burneth away the sin of the world. Now, you could go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, and you will see the principle of lambs burning sin. Sometimes they were lambs, sometimes they were young goats, Sometimes they were other animals, but the principle is there from the opening pages of the Bible. I suspect the Hebrew writer uh, refers to the first time that man themselves did it, and that is when he refers to the blood of Abel, the sacrifice of Abel. It is evident that God had made a sacrifice previously to provide skin for Adam and Eve, but it appears that the first recorded example was an individual who sacrificed an animal, and it was pleasing to God. Uh, you could not go too much further in your Bible. You'll find uh, more. You'll find men who were men of the altar. But when you come to Exodus, you'll come to a Passover, and you'll find there a lamb sacrificed for a family, and maybe even for what we would call an extended 
family. And when you come into the book of Leviticus, and in Leviticus you have all the feasts before you, you'll find that great day of atonement. And you'll find on that day that a sacrifice of an animal is made for a nation. But John the Baptist intimates in John chapter 1, this is not now. A lamb provided by an individual for an individual, or by an individual for his family, or by a priest and a nation for a nation. This is a lamb provided by God for the world. I don't think the world, by the way, here means just the different aspects of the world. I think it means precisely what it says. He's the lamb of God who burneth away the sin, singular, of the world. And the Lord Jesus is well aware of it. When we come to chapter 4, his disciples come back and with some surprise, they find him sitting at a well, uh, the city at Sychar, the city of Samaria, and they see him talking to this woman. Now, he sent them to buy meat, as we pointed out last night, because he was hungry. And he'd asked for a drink, partially because he was thirsty. And he'd sat at the well, partially because he was weary. And now they come back and it appears that he's not taking any great interest in taking food. And they ask him and they tell him and they advise him that it would be a good idea. And then he says, well, you don't understand. He says, I've got a meat to eat that you don't know of. And he says, what it is, is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish, it's a different form of the same verb, and to finish the work that he's given me to do. In the next chapter, when he's preaching, having seen it already announced, he now acknowledges it. And he says to the people of the day, that he has a work that he's been given to finish. In John 17, he prays to his father, and he says, I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. Now, we're going to return to that in a moment. Some have suggested that that is it being anticipated. And until very recently, I would probably have agreed with that, but I'm now not so sure that that's the case. But I do think he is talking of a part of this great work then as we've read tonight in john 19 he uses the word again he's used it of course in verse 28 jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished and even that verb that the scripture might be fulfilled is another tense of the same verse the scripture being uh, the same verb scripture being fulfilled and now he says it is finished Another form of the word is found and translated for us, finisher. And that is in Hebrews 12. And I would suggest if what we have in John's gospel is this work announced and acknowledged and anticipated perhaps and accomplished, in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, it is accepted. What we read there is this. He is the author and finisher of faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's been accepted. He sat down. Now we'll return to that in a moment. What I'm looking at at the moment is what this cry means to the Lord Jesus. In a moment, we'll also consider what it means to God. We'll also consider what it means to us. But at the moment, we're restricting ourselves to what it means to the Lord Jesus himself. And the Lord Jesus himself says, it is finished. It is a word, tetelestai, that was in very common use. It was in common use in a lot of formats and a lot of areas of life, even amongst people who didn't speak Greek. It's a bit like some of these words we have today, Coca-Cola and Hallelujah. And there are some others that are almost international words. It was a word that a servant would often use at the end of a day. When his day of, of strife and toil was over, he would say, Tetelastai, 
It's accomplished. It's completed. It's a word that an artist apparently would use as he put the final touches to a masterpiece. And he would say, Tetelestai, it is finished. He's touched up the last little bits here and there, and there's nothing, nothing is now going to improve it. He's never going to return to it again. He's created exactly what was in his mind, and he looks upon it now and he says with satisfaction, it is finished. It's a word, apparently, that Roman soldiers, now when I say Roman prisoners, rather, I mean prisoners who were actual Romans. Remember, like Paul, there was a big issue about imprisoning Romans. You'll see that when he went to Philippi, and he said, you've imprisoned us, and we're Romans, and you did it without even a trial. But there were occasions when Romans had a trial, and Romans were imprisoned. And having served the sentence, they were given a little certificate and a declaration. And that was the declaration to basically say that whatever the misdemeanor was, they had borne the sentence, it was now complete, and there was nothing left for them to do to make restitution. And they were given a piece of paper that said on it, Tetelestai, there's nothing else to make restitution, you've paid the price. In a similar sense, the merchant used it. This was its most common use. Its most common use was in commerce. I know we don't see it so much today. I'm only just about old enough to remember it. But I can remember folks who used to come to your door with a little book and you were paying something up. And they would come every so often and you'd pay the deposit. And then there were installments and they would come every now and again to collect the installment. And after each installment was paid, eventually the little book's ticked off and it's closed. Uh, and for the reason of the ticking off, people used to refer to it as buying something on tick because you were just paying it by installments. Well, in that day, they had something similar. And you'll see it mentioned in some of the parables where you would have somebody who had a bill and it has on it what they owed. And of course, the administrator could take the bill and change it and alter it, as the Lord Jesus says in one of the parables. But what generally happened was they would come and pay an installment. And then the administrator would net off that payment and would just about put down the balance of what remained. And as payment after payment after payment came in, he would continue doing that until the final payment cleared the debt. And then they would take a stamp and they would stamp right on top of the uh, invoice of the bill, Tetelestai. And this is what it most commonly meant, paid in full. There's nothing left to pay. It's paid in full. There is one other use that it had, and that was by those who weren't Romans now speaking Greek or Greeks speaking Greek, but these remarkably were Hebrews speaking Greek. And it's a most interesting one because the priest apparently, and there is record of this, would take the victims for the sacrifice and they would scrutinize it and they would look as the scripture requires in the deepest of detail and they would ensure that the sacrifice that was being brought was absolutely spotless and without blemish and perfect and when they'd examined it all and made sure everything was just right tetelestai they would say I've checked it out, and everything is just perfect. You start to get a little bit of the meaning, don't you, from these things. What I want to say is this. The Lord Jesus, I think in terms of this phrase, uses it on more than one occasion, at least a form of it. As I mentioned in John 17, when he says, I have finished the work. I generally had accepted along with many that the idea there was that this was anticipating in the purpose of God it was as good as done <clears throat> and in John 19 it's now accomplished. But I have to say I, I'm indebted to one of your 
former speakers at one of these weeks, uh, our dear brother Phil Coulson. And uh, listening not that long ago now to Phil, he pointed out something that I've since looked at and I've come to the conclusion that I would agree with him. Now, Phil and I don't always come to those conclusions, but on this particular occasion, I'd have to say I'm indebted to him particularly. And we've come to the, well, I've come to the conclusion that he's right. And uh, I'm sure that doesn't mean he's always going to come to the conclusion that I'm right or necessarily vice versa. What Phil suggests is this, and I think this is lovely. I'm just passing this on to you now. And I'm telling you where I got it from. In John 17, he says that he believes the Lord Jesus is speaking now as the offerer, the person who brings their offering. And as he approaches Calvary, he looks back now on his life. And as he had intimated earlier, the whole bent of his life is going to be to please the Father. And of course, God is going to open heaven. And declarations of one description or another are going to be made at his birth, at his baptism, at the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, and even, I would suggest, in these events here, not necessarily always with voices from heaven, but ne ne nevertheless, declarations are made to make it abundantly clear that he's pleased the Father. In John 17, this is what he says. I have glorified thee on the earth. And I do think that Phil is right. This is really like the offerer coming with his offering and scrutinizing it and looking at it. And as the Old Testament would have said, any spot, any blemish, anything that wasn't just perfect. But the Lord Jesus in John 17, as he prays to his father, can look over his life and he can say in the whole of this life and in every step, and in every action, and in every word, and in every thought, and in every moment of every day, I have brought glory to thee. A life of absolute perfection. And he says, I've finished. Now, he doesn't use the tetelestai word, but he does use a form of the verb. Now we come to John 19, the verse that's before us tonight. And Brother Phil says, and I think we would all agree now, uh, the Lord Jesus now is the offering. He's not now the individual bringing the offering. He is the offering itself. And you'll get that, of course, won't you, in the book of the Hebrews. He, by the eternal spirit, he offered himself unto God. So very clearly, he is not only the offerer, but he is the offering. And as the offering, at the very moment that those hours of darkness are finished, that he has taken the drink to fulfill the last scripture that was his responsibility to fulfill, at that moment, knowing that all things were now accomplished, he says, Tetelestai, it's paid in full. This is the sacrifice that the Hebrew writer says, will never need to be repeated. He's appeared once in the end of the age. He has put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He has offered one sacrifice for sins forever. And now he's sat down at the right hand of God. And that brings us back to, well, Hebrews 10, as we've quoted, but also Hebrews 12, verse 2 the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now sat down. You go into that temple or the tabernacle, apart from the mercy seat, which is for God alone, well, there's a table in there, but there's no chairs. There's no seats. You see, our brother Phil says, what the Lord Jesus is now, or who the Lord Jesus is now, is not just the offerer, and not even only the offerer and the offering. That in itself is remarkable. But he's also the priest. He's the officiating priest. And having made this sacrifice, he sits down. Priests don't sit down. 
priests stand and priests minister and priests attend, but you won't find priests sitting down because they offered often the same sacrifices that could never make the commas that unto it perfect and could never give a clean conscience. For all they were doing was covering it and covering it and covering it and covering it. But not so this man. It is finished. It's over. He can sit down. He's examined the offering and it's absolutely perfect. It's complete. It's perfect. That's another word that's often used, by the way. When you're in the book of the Hebrews, nine times you'll find a form of this verb and it's always translated perfect. And it even refers to us being made perfect through the work of the Lord Jesus. The Hebrews tell us that all of those sacrifices of old, they could never make the commas that unto perfect. But this one has. This one is the end of it all. The old economy is finished. The veil is going to be rent. There's no requirement anymore for all of that ritual and all of that ceremony. It's all coming to an end. And the offerer has been examined and he's per the offering that he's bringing is absolutely perfect. And the offering has been made and God, as we're about to see, is utterly and totally satisfied. And the priest who officiated, the Lord Jesus himself, can now sit down in heaven because the sacrifice has been completely accepted. That which was announced and, accept, uh, uh, and acknowledged and anticipated and accomplished has now been accepted. What, what a wonderful cry it is. Paid in full. Paid in full. And we love to preach it in the gospel, don't we? Spurgeon says this. This is the distinguishing mark of Christianity. Religion says do. Christianity says done. And that is true of religion, isn't it? It's all about what you need to do. But our wonderful faith, which he is the author and finisher of, the only true faith, the faith, it's all about done, not do. It is finished. Now let's briefly say a little bit about what it means to God. Well now, the first thing it means is this. That his intrinsic holiness and righteousness. Remember we looked at that in the hours of darkness. Thou art holy, thou who inhabitest the praises of Israel. Holy, holy, holy. Pure eyes than to behold evil, cannot look upon iniquity. His presence, nothing that defileth shall ever enter in. Well, his righteousness is satisfied. There's a man in the glory. He's seated at his right hand. One of the other things you would see in that letter to the Hebrews is not only is the Lord Jesus the offerer, the offering and the priest, but he is the propitiator, the propitiatory and the propitiation. Now that all sounds a little bit complicated, doesn't it? But what it means is this, you see, when you went to that tabernacle, propitiation was made at the altar of burnt offering. The propitiator then took the blood in to the holiest of all and sprinkled the mercy seat, which was the propitiatory. That's what the word mercy seat literally means. Now, the Lord Jesus, of course, is typified by all three of those. He has made propitiation. What does that mean? That means that he has fully satisfied and intrinsically holy God. God cannot overlook sin. And what he's also done is he's made peace. We call that the great truth of reconciliation. Now, I did already know this, but our dear brother Phil, and what I listened to recently, also points out this, and I would have pointed out for myself anyway. Please never think of reconciliation as bringing two opposing sides together to meet somewhere in the middle. Because that has got nothing to do with biblical reconciliation. 
God is moving nowhere. He has no need to move one iota. He is intrinsically right, and we are intrinsically wrong. So we are reconciled unto God. And not only are we reconciled and in peace from being in enmity, the remarkable thing is in that upper room, the Lord Jesus tells the disciples, and it applies to us as well. We are his friends. Now that is a staggering truth, isn't it? Once in enmity, as Paul said to those Ephesians, and he could have said it about you and I as well, because we're Gentiles, it's equally true. Strangers and aliens from the Commonwealth of Israel, without God and without hope in the world. Aliens, enemies, now hath he reconciled. So not only is the righteousness of God required, but God's a God who wants peace and he wants reconciliation. And that's been satisfied. And he's also achieved redemption. There's been a price paid. I'm going to quote you one of my dad's favorite verses in the Bible. Uh, many a Sunday morning, I can remember it. Along with Hebrews 1, I can remember this being quoted. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed one another. Psalm 85, verse 10. Mercy. God wants to be merciful. But truth, he has to be faithful to himself. He's the God who cannot lie. Righteousness, he's intrinsically holy. But peace, he wants the guilty sinner to be at peace with him. And when the Lord Jesus cried on that cross, it is finished. Paid in full. He has satisfied the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the need for restitution. He's satisfied it all. He's brought back the entire universe. He's recovered everything and more that was lost in Adam. And at the same time, he's made wonderful provision for us. At the same time, just before I go on to what it means for us, I want to say a little something else that it means to God, and we'll touch on it again later on. It means that at that moment, God required nothing else. What would normally have followed is that they would have made his grave with the wicked. But there was no need for any further humiliation. God now intervened. And as we'll see in a moment or two, he would be with the rich in his death, as Isaiah 53 verse 9 had predicted. No need for anything further. No need for the breaking of legs. No need for the taking of a body and casting it on the rubbish heap, which was the general uh, way in which a crucifixion ended. It's finished. God says enough. And he steps in and overrules. And men's circumstances change. And all that was expected doesn't take place, humanly speaking. And he didn't have his grave with the wicked. He was with, his ri the, with the rich in his death. Now very quickly, let's just touch on what it means to us before we look briefly at the final phrase. Well, it means a number of things to you and I. It means, first of all, that man's struggle for rest Man's struggle for righteousness, man's struggle to be accepted by God is completely over. We're now justified. Righteousness has been bestowed upon us, clothed with garments not our own, bought with the price and the wonderful truth of justification. The wonderful realization of a sinner that he's taken our place. The great truth of substitution. That lovely, lovely hymn by Top Lady, Augustus Top Lady. I had it there as I was clearing out, I found my dad's gospel hymn book. And there's the verse. Most of us don't know the first half of the verse. I'll read it all, but here's this, here it is. If thou hast my discharge procured, and freely in my place endured, 
the whole of wrath divine. <clears throat> Payment God will not twice demand, first at my bleeding surety's hand, and then again at mine. Payment God will not twice demand, first at my bleeding surety's hand, and then again at mine. Paid in full. Satan's power over us has been defeated. Hebrews 2 tells us wonderfully, doesn't it? He partook of flesh and blood. Why? That he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Not only that, we've been freed from the law. The law that condemns us. The law that can never save us. The law that simply exposes us as being unrighteous has now been fully satisfied. Again, I think it's Spurgeon who says that ten uh, pro that, that ten pronged flaying of the commandments has been worn out on the back of our blessed Saviour. It's gone. It's dealt with. He's satisfied it. He's fulfilled it. Now just be very careful that you don't go further than Scripture. Death has not yet been defeated the lord jesus has gone into death and come out of death and he's demonstrated that the power is there he's demonstrated that the one who had the power of death has been defeated but there is a day coming soon when the corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying Death <clears throat> is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? Thy sting. O oh, grave, where is thy victory? So be very careful. Don't, don't stand in a graveside and quote those words uh, because the sting is right in front of your eyes and the victory of the grave is right in front of you and you'll leave half an hour later and the one that you loved, you'll leave their mortal remains in Mother Earth. But... Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. The law has been fulfilled. And that final victory will be the victory over death. The Lord Jesus has demonstrated. Satan is defeated. We could have given him one of our little headings tonight. We could have asked what it means to him. It means he's not only been defeated, but this is what the Lord Jesus said. The prince of this world is judged the sentence has not yet been carried out but he's already been judged and he's already lost and the battle is not going to be at armageddon that is just going to be the final outcome the battle took place at calvary and it is finished where are we going to meet our savior we're going to meet him in the air i always think there's a a wonderful irony about that. The scripture says of the wicked one, he's the prince of the power of the earth. It's his domain. The Lord Jesus went back to heaven and how did he do it? He went right through his domain. And the scripture says this, he made a show of him openly. He's defeated. He's conquered. He's vanquished. Death could not keep its prey. Jesus, my savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord. But very quickly, we have another little expression to look at as we draw to a close. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Father. Well, we pointed out, didn't we, the first cry. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How appropriate that this last cry. Father into thy hands i commend my spirit luke chapter 2 as a boy of 12 he said i must be about my father's business luke chapter 3 he prayed to his father at the commencement of his ministry in verse 21 and in verse 22 his father responded here i would judge his father responds again men's plans are thwarted and god's plans are carried out and he goes to his father the very last verses of the 
the very last words of the Savior in this very gospel is that he bestows upon them the promise of my Father. Into thy hands. Do you remember that fateful occasion in the life of David when he was made aware of his sin and he was given the options about how it would be dealt with? Falling into the hands of men for a longer period, falling into the hands of God for a shorter period. David, the gentle-hearted man, the man after God's own heart, who said of his nephews, these sons of Zeruiah be too hard for me. He said, don't let me fall into the hands of men. Oh, this is a wondrous moment. The Savior's been in the hands of men and they've done their worst. And now he's going into the hands of his father. Father, into thy hands, I commend, I commend. Nobody else could say this, you know. There's a wonderful, wonderful picture of death here. But I often think for you and I, the lovely picture of death I often like to look at is in the Acts of the Apostles and in chapter 7. And it's a lovely, lovely man called Stephen. And one of the wonderful things about Stephen is you'll discover that he resembles the Lord Jesus. It says his face was as the face of an angel. It says that they could not refute the words that he spoke. But the hatred it provoked was similar. It says they gnashed against him with their teeth. They were enraged just as they were with the Savior because he exposed them. You know, in that passage, two things that Stephen says are quoted. And they mirror the first and last of the seven sayings of the Lord Jesus. There's a lovely word that describes the Lord Jesus. He tells the onlookers, I think it's an image that burned into the heart of Saul of Tarsus and lasted for him all of his life, even as the Apostle Paul. I think the image of Stephen was burned into his conscience and into his soul, and it brought him to Christ, and it never left him. And when the Savior says it's hard for you to kick against the pricks, I suspect it's the pricks that came into his conscience as he remembered that lovely soul coming to the end of his life. And what did he say? He looked, and the word is the Lord Jesus was stooping, waiting to receive him and he said lord jesus receive my spirit and regarding his tormentors he said lay not this sin to their charge now they are noticeably different from what the savior said but also noticeably similar only god can forgive sins and stephen couldn't bring that beseechment because there was no repentance but just what they'd done to him he said, don't lay that, chip, that particular sin against their charge. And he knew he was going to the Father. And he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. But he couldn't say exactly what the Savior said. I commend my spirit. You see, even when you and I go to heaven, we'll never be able to say that we're there on any merit of our own whatsoever. But our blessed Saviour is there entirely on his own merit. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. He's there in merit. He has the right to be there. Now finally, and we don't want to complicate things. My spirit. Now 1 Thessalonians 5 makes it absolutely clear that we are tripartite beings. Paul says, that he prays for and he wants the preservation of their body and their soul and their spirit in entirety. We would ask the almost unanswerable question, and what is the difference between the soul and the spirit? Well, there clearly is a difference because Hebrews 4 verse 12 states there is a difference and the word of God is able to divide between them. I think we need to go to one of the strangest books in our Bible to get a little bit of help, and it's the book of Ecclesiastes. 
the book of Ecclesiastes tells me that the beasts have a spirit that goes down into the earth. But we have a spirit that goes upward. And he confirms that in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. And the writer of the Ecclesiastes says, the spirit returns to God. Now, when I put those statements together, I have to come to the conclusion that the spirit is the invisible life force that is in us all and that is even in the animal kingdom. But when their life force departs, the body goes to the earth and that goes downward with it. And that's the end of them. Now, I'm very sorry if you've got great hopes of various uh, beloved pets being with you in heaven, but I'm afraid I can't find anything in scripture to back that up. Uh, apart, somebody suggested about, they said there was a horses at least in heaven. Well, that may or may not be the case, but I don't think any of our pets are there. Uh, Ecclesiastes says they go downward, but we have a life force, all human beings. And Ecclesiastes, I think, suggests that that aspect returns to God. That leaves us with the soul. The soul, it appears to me, is that which is responsive to God, that which is the real me. The soul is what needs to be saved. Isn't it lovely that it's uh, the mother of the Lord Jesus who says most beautifully regarding her soul? And she speaks about her inner being in this very gospel, chapter 1 and verse 46. My soul magnifies the Lord. You see, it's the God responsive part. That's why the scripture says, what if you should gain the whole world and lose your soul? In other words, you've never responded to God. You've never come to salvation. And that bit that could have responded, you're going to be lost. It's really often the word is simply interchangeable with life. To be eternally saved or to be eternally lost. You know, there is a resurrection for all. That's taught in John's Gospel, chapter 5. A resurrection unto life and a resurrection unto death. We will have bodies fitted for glory. The unjust will have bodies fitted for judgment. And the soul is lost. But of the Lord Jesus, it says, his soul would not be left in Hades or Sheol. And I use that word advisedly because I think it's wrong to use the word hell. His soul would be not left in Sheol, and his, the Holy One, his body, would not suffer corruption. But there and then from the cross, where did he go? I personally believe he went straight to heaven. We saw it back in the second saying. Today, thou shalt be with me, the real man, the absolute essence of the Lord Jesus. You'll be with me where? In paradise in the very presence of god the savior he yielded his spirit here he commends it to god his body would rise in three days time and ultimately he would ascend to heaven ah the question is where he was in the intervening periods when we don't see him during those 40 days and that's a question we'll have to leave for the great theologians online tonight to help us with but I want to suggest that in a moment here, the Savior went straight into heaven. I think it is a picture for you and I. There are no intermediate places. There are no periods of testing. There are nothing of that nature. Those three occasions when I've sat at a bedside and I've seen a grandfather and the father and the mother breathe their last. I believe with all my heart, at the very moment the final breath came out, they were with Christ, and it was far better. When my dad passed away, I was reading Psalm 23. I was reading it to him. And I was right on the verse. Dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And his final breath was issued from his mouth. And our Saviour turns now. And he's going to bow his head. And his life's not going to be taken. It's going to be given. And he's going straight into the presence of God. 
And just a few minutes probably later, the dying thief is going to have his legs broken and he's going to suffocate and he's going to break his last. And in a moment, he's going to be with Christ and it's going to be very far better. What an amazing panorama of the work of Christ these lovely sayings have been for us. What a staggering truth that he has experienced. Again, what my dad would call, I don't normally use the word, but I'll use it now, all the vicissitudes of life. He's been through them all. He's known what it is to be wrong. They hated me without a cause, but he cries, Father, forgive me. He knows what it is to feel the struggle of the journey and the anguish and the awfulness of all the foes that are raised against him. But he sees of the travail of his soul and he's satisfied and he does it for the joy that's set before him. Verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He knows the sadness of looking down on that faithful woman and that beloved disciple. Looking down, humanly speaking, at the moment of separation. Woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. He knows the anguish, the awfulness of that cry that is beyond our understanding. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He knows the awfulness of human suffering, even to the point where the tongue cleaves to the mouth and a drop of water is required, and the cry goes out, I thirst. He knows what it is to accomplish everything, a perfect life, an atoning death, and to sit down in total complacent accomplishment, that it never needs to be revisited. The work that was started was finished, and it remains finished, and it'll always be finished. And he knows what it is to go through the article of death. And if we're called upon to go through it, if Mr. Spurgeon, I quote him again, but I can't agree with him. Mr. Spurgeon says he wanted to die. <laughs> he says he wanted to die because he wanted to experience everything that the Savior experienced. Well, I'm afraid I'm with the hymn writer. Well, what would it be to go without dying? I'd rather be taken, I have to confess. But if we are called upon to go through the article of death. He's been before us. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And as Stephen at the moment of death can say, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And we too can have the absolute confidence. Maybe many of us feel we're near the finish of the course. And that being the case, maybe not long now, till we too will be with Christ, which is very far better.